Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Get Outdoors PA webinar, Preventing Tick Bites and Tick-Borne Disease. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Nikki Tusher, and I'm the Director of Training and Get Outdoors PA with the Pennsylvania Recreation and Park Society. Here with me is my coworker, Emily Gates, the Director of Strategic Partnerships. She is running the technical side for us. Before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping tips. This webinar is being recorded. All participants are muted. If you have questions or comments, please submit them at the chat box at the bottom left side of your screen. We will address all questions at the end of the webinar. You will receive a link to the recorded webinar and a copy of the presentation slides following the webinar via email. This webinar is approved for 0.1 CEU or one contact hour. The final presentation slide includes a link to a quiz and instructions. Please make sure to take the quiz immediately following the presentation. A little background on who we are. Get Outdoors PA is a joint initiative among community and statewide partners that strives to connect citizens with outdoor recreation activities to increase their appreciation and active use of parks, forests, and public spaces while imparting an message of environmental stewardship and healthy living. Get Outdoors PA partners are committed to providing outdoor recreation and education events in the communities they serve. These events are designed to connect people to the outdoors through opportunities to learn and promote activities including hiking, fishing, hunting, camping, and biking. The Get Outdoors PA flagship partners are listed on your screen. In addition, Get Outdoors PA has 84 state park partners, 167 community partners, and sorry, we forgot to update that slide. Community partners are made up of park and rec departments, land trusts, environmental education centers, and more. If you're interested in becoming a community partner, look for the link at the end of this presentation. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. We have Nicole Cicini, who is a certified Dare to Be Tick Aware Lead Seminar Leader. She is, an, she is a microbiologist, a forensic scientist at East Strasburg University. We also have Michelle Cassatori, also a certified Dare to Be Tick Aware Lead Seminar Leader, who is a licensed occupational therapist with the NEPA Lyme Support Group Leader and a PA Lyme Board Member. Nicole, Michelle, would you each like to say a quick hello? Hello everybody, this is Nicole and I'm going to get started in a second right after Michelle says hi. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Michelle, I'll be speaking after Nicole. Great, we, they have a lot of good information coming up, so now I'm going to hand everything over to Nicole. Okay, hello everyone. So we're going to get started here. Um, we have a great presentation for you. I'm going to do the first half and then Michelle's going to follow me with the second half. Um, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in here. Um, the first thing I do want to cover is that we have a medical advice disclaimer. So everything we say today is just to help you with understanding and knowing more information about ticks and Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. Um, we're not providing you with any medical um, advice or uh, diagnosis. So we're going to start today with going through some trends overviews of Lyme disease and what's going on in the state of Pennsylvania. We're going to move into some tick habitats, um, tick-borne diseases, and then Michelle will talk to you about preventing tick bites and what to do if you do have a tick bite. And then we'll wrap it up with a Q&A. And just a reminder, just put your questions in the um, box below. So in Pennsylvania in 2014, we passed uh, PA Act 83, which is our first step to moving forth with um, posing the threat of Lyme disease in Pennsylvania. So what this is was recommendations to the Secretary of Health and the PA Department of Health and all the PA legislators, and it provided prevention, education awareness, and surveillance recommendations, and it was aimed at slowing or reducing the number of cases and incidences of Lyme and tick-borne diseases in Pennsylvania. So to date, we've implemented this program, which is Dare to be Tick Aware, providing community-based awareness programs across the state. Um, and we're also working on increasing the information that's available on the PA Department of Health's website. 
So the PA prevention program that we're giving you today, our goal is to improve the public prevention response through our community awareness and education. We're funded through the CDC's Preventative Health Block, and we're available to bring this to any of your community groups or businesses. So if you do have um, a business or a group that you would like us to present to, please contact info at PA Lyme, and we can get that scheduled for you. So Lyme disease is the fastest growing infectious disease in the United States. As you can see by this map, it's been increasing over uh, the last decade and more. Uh, recently, in 2014-15, the CDC did some studies looking at um, laboratories that do blood testing on humans and determined that the actual confirmed cases that are reported are underestimated by at least 10 to 12 times. So with 30,000 new cases a year taking in that factor, we actually have 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease a year. So that makes it the most infectious disease in the United States above, as you can see here at the bottom, hepatitis and HIV can uh, and the different cancers. So we really do have a problem here in Pennsylvania. It's not even, it's not just Pennsylvania. You can see from this map, each blue dot represents a case of Lyme disease. Um, from 1996 to 2015, you can see the expansion of Lyme disease cases across completely covering Pennsylvania as well as the Northeast. So Pennsylvania has been the leading state of Lyme disease cases since 2011. Um, in 2016, we had just a, over 100,000 and 114,000 actual cases of Lyme disease. And as well as our bordering states, there's 14 states that make up 95% of these cases and four of them are surrounding Pennsylvania. So it's Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and Delaware. So we are in the hot spot of these cases. Furthermore, if you look at the number of cases that you have in New York and New Jersey, um, you can add those up and they would not even equal um, as many cases as we have in Pennsylvania. So we have almost 12,000 cases here and it's been increasing over the last few years. There are hotspots um, by incidences per 100,000 people. So what that means is incidences are exposure to tick bites or Lyme disease. So we've been increasing, and you can see on this map, darker means higher inc incidences where whites um, very few. And our incidence rates have been changing, and they do change yearly. And we used to think that the northeast and southeast portion of the state had the highest number of cases, but you can see that it's more concentrated in the central portion of the United States, or in Pennsylvania. Our children in Pennsylvania are actually at the highest risk. You could see by this map is separated by age groups. Um, the males are blue, females are yellow, and we have our two most at-risk groups, and we have our children ages 5 to 10 and 15, and then we have our um, middle age 40 to 55 year olds, and you can kind of think about our time frame and what these individuals are doing at this time. We have our children that are outdoors doing um, risky activities, rolling around, playing outside on the playgrounds. And then we have our 40 to 55 year olds. We have older children at this time, and we have more time on our hands to do more hobbies, gardening, being outside, cleaning the yards, and things like that, putting us at risk for tick bites. Oops, didn't mean to go that fast. Uh, Tick-borne diseases are emerging rapidly, and we just want to point out that it's not just Lyme disease that's an issue across Pennsylvania, it's other pathogens as well. You can see here there's an extensive list of different tick-borne diseases. Each one represented with an asterisk is a pathogen that has been identified um, or confirmed in a, as a human case in Pennsylvania. Um, so you can see it's not just Lyme disease, and these infections do come um, together via transmission by a tick. So you can potentially be exposed to more than one pathogen by, by one tick bite. So to get into ticks and the habitat of ticks, it's really important to understand these in the ticks themselves to help you understand when you're at risk and what to do. So ticks, what are they? They're ectoparasites, meaning they feed on the external portion of a mammal, bird, or reptile. Uh, they don't burrow completely in. They only burrow their mouth parts. They're part of the spider family, which is the arachnids. They're found globally in temperate areas. So these are areas that have four seasons that vary in their temperature. Um, the black-legged tick, which is the deer tick that transmits Lyme disease, has been identified in every state of the United States except Hawaii. They do have four life stages. Um, they have three feeding and four total life stages. So they start off as egg, hatch into the larvae, then into the nymph, and then into adult. Um, they're capable of transmitting pathogens, and they can transmit pathogens at any of these life stages. Um, the pathogens that they transmit are typically maintained in the wildlife population, specifically our mice and our small uh, mammals. 
So I'm going to go through the ticks, the main ticks that are found in Pennsylvania. The first one is the black-legged deer tick. This is typically referred to as the deer tick, but it's also called the black-legged tick, so they are the same thing. Um, you can see its distribution map here in yellow is areas where it's found, but it has been identified in all U.S. states. Um, Pennsylvania is completely covered. This is one of our most common ticks that we have. You have its different life stages, larvae, nymph, the adult male, adult female. We want to point out the adult female has the red body with the black shield, and the nymph is tiny and black and white in color. Um, these two are the main ones to focus on with transmission of Lyme disease, the nymph and adult female. The next tick we have is our American dog tick. This is much larger in size than the black-legged tick, but it's our second most common tick we find mainly in the springtime in Pennsylvania. You can see its distribution is um, a little larger than the black-legged tick, via the map here by the yellow um, coloration. The adult females and the adult males have coloration across their, their backside of their body, so you see that white coloration. They also have brown legs. Uh, the black-legged tick has black legs, um, and they are twice the size of a black-legged tick. The next tick that we have in Pennsylvania is the Lone Star Tick. The Lone Star Tick is found more in the southern regions of Pennsylvania, but it has been expanding its range into the northern regions. It's identified and depicted by the females with this white dot on its back. Um, they have a reddish-brown color, slightly larger than the black-legged tick, but smaller than the um, uh, American dog tick. The nymph ticks are hard to determine the difference between black-legged tick and lone star tick. Um, you need a microscope and expert to do that for you. And these guys are capable of trans, um, transmitting similar pathogens to uh, Lyme disease. One other important factor about the lone star tick is the afragal allergy. You may have heard this. It triggers a red meat allergy. What it is is these ticks have within their saliva different sugars, and these sugars represent the different sugars and proteins that are found within red meats. So just like peanuts, some people that are exposed to this will end up having an allergic reaction to red meat down the lines. It could happen after one bite. It could happen after multiple bites of the tick. But it's essentially your body's building up an immune response to the tick biting you as a foreign object. And then you eat red meat, and it think, it's thinking you're being bit by a tick, and you have an allergic reaction. Um, so this can occur. Um, after one bite or many a bites, and not everybody could, um, essentially all the ticks carry it, but not everyone will have the allergic reaction. The last tick we're going to talk about is the brown dog tick. The brown dog tick is the most widely distributed tick. Um, it has no coloration on its body. It's brown in color, um, yellowish red legs. Um, I'm going to jump to the next slide. What's important about the brown dog tick, unlike the other three ticks that I did mention, is that these are one host ticks, so they tend to live their entire life on the same host. Um, they're typically found on mainly dogs, but they are picked up in areas more of a urban area than suburban areas um, or rural areas, and they're found more so in festing homes. So kennels, typically if you board your dog in a kennel, your dog can pick up these ticks at the kennel, bring them home, and since they're a one-host tick, they'll survive on the dog for about six months. They'll fall off and lay their eggs in the crack of your home, um, and ticks can lay anywhere between two to 4,000 eggs at a time, and it can cause an infestation in your home. So if you have animals and you board your animals at kennels, you always want to be um, treat them with uh, any types of repellents for ticks, as well as check them very thoroughly when you, when you come home. So tick ecology, um, the tick habitat does vary depending on areas, but the main ones you want to focus on are things in areas where it keeps the ticks out of direct sunlight and it can keep them cool and moist. So tall grass, thick brush, wooded area, forest edges, stone walls, leaf litter, downed wood, base of trees. The rule of thumb we like to say is anywhere where you're going to find your wildlife populations, like your deer and your mice, even your bears and coyotes, you're going to find your tick populations because they're their little taxi drivers in and out of different areas. So that's how they transport in and out of areas. Um, so if you're finding a lot of wildlife, you're going to find a lot of ticks in that area as well. So here's some examples of where ticks do like to live. Um, so prime locations. Uh, under rocks or underneath the leaf litter is great. Under rocks is great habitat for mice, so you're going to find ticks in that area. Downed wood or trees, that's also good habitat for mice, while resulting in a tick population. Um, at the bases of trees, uh, our wildlife tends to create daybeds. At the bases of trees, our deer are bare, um, dropping off ticks in this area. 
uh, underneath picnic tables. They tend to be cool and moist under there, and you can get an established population there. Um, and stone walls as well, again, where mice like to uh, live. So tick behaviors, how do we come across ticks and how do ticks find us? The one thing that they cannot do is they cannot jump or fly. Ticks are, don't have wings and they don't have any capabilities of propelling themselves with their legs. But what they do do is they sit at the blades of grass, as you can see in these pictures, and they stick out their front legs. They don't have eyes, so they can't see you, but they do have these organs underneath their front legs, and they can sense this and detect the CO2, your body odors, pheromones, heat, and any vibrations up to about 50 feet away. When they start to sense that, they start to swing their front legs around, and once you brush by, they'll grab on. They grab on typically from the waist down and then crawl up. Um, this is called a questing behavior when they sit at the blades of grass. Um, this is typical for the black-legged tick as well as the American dog tick. The lone star tick is a little bit more aggressive and it will actually crawl towards its source. So once it starts to sense the CO2, heat, and pheromones, it will actually crawl towards its source as opposed to waiting. So where do ticks like to quest? They like to quest in areas where they can get to the edges of grass and that they'll be um, exposed to a passerby or as in any type of mammal, reptile, or bird. So tall grasses, edges of forest, um, shrubs, or brush that's um, left out. So really they won't go too much further than where their initial habitat is um, and they'll just crawl to the ends and quest until something comes by for them to pick up on. So the black-legged tick will live for two years. Um, at life stage starts as, as an egg. Typically eggs are laid around this time of the year. The eggs will hatch into larvae in about the summertime, August, September. The larvae tend to feed on smaller mammals like birds and mice where they can potentially pick up a pathogen. They go into a dormant phase over the fall and winter where they morph and grow an extra set of legs into its nymphal life stage. The nymphs are extremely active during the springtime, which is right now. Um, this is our highest risk of exposure to pathogens just because their their size, they're so tiny, it's a challenge to find them until they've been attached for too long and puts you at risk of transmitting any pathogens that they're carrying. If they feed on an animal where they can get their complete blood meal, such as a deer, coyote, or a mice, um, they'll go into another dormant phase over the summer and then they'll come back out in the fall time as their adult stage. If uh, the adult ticks don't get their full blood meal during the fall, they can overwinter and survive over winter depending on our weather and come out at about this time of the year. Um, and the lab that I work in, we do a lot of tick testing and we have had an extreme um, influx of the adult ticks in the last three weeks. So they are out there and they are moving. Um, your exposure rate right here, anytime the temperature is above freezing in the winter time, you can be at risk of a tick bite. So they will come out and uh, seek a source at that time, mainly the adults. The nymphs will become active just about now. We're starting to see them through the summer, and then the adults come back out in the fall. And you see that the dangerous months will peak the time that the nymphs are most active, and that is because of their tiny size. And you can see in the pictures here on the right side, the nymph is on the the fingernail and the adult is right next to it. So the size depiction between the two is much um, different. Ticks can feed and engorge themselves for more than five days. They can feed up to 10 days at some point. Um, they do take in an extensive amount of blood at, um, during the time at which they're feeding, increasing their body size. And you can see in this picture at the top right, you have an unfed tick on the left and then a fully engorged tick on the right. So as the tick is feeding over time, it does increase in size and that does make it challenging to identify what type of tick you have as it uh, changes in its um, characteristics at those life stages. So you lose the red body and you have more of a brownish black body once it becomes engorged with your blood. Um, you can see the size differences between the black-legged tick and the dog tick. Dog ticks become very easy to find due to their size, but it's very challenging to find um, a black-legged tick. So tick host, um, a myth is that deer are gonna only, do not play any role in the spread of Lyme disease. The only thing that deer right now play a role in is amplifying the number of ticks that we have or increasing the number of ticks that we have in the population. So ticks, as you can see in this picture, will completely infest a wildlife animal such as a white-tailed deer, completing its blood meal, allowing it to go into its next life cycle or next life stage. So adults completing their blood meal will fall off, go into a dormant phase, lay their eggs, and that they can lay anywhere between two and 4,000 eggs. So 
one white-tailed deer has been found to have over 400 ticks investing in at a time. So if you have 400 ticks and their adult females finishing their blood meals, they can fall off and lay anywhere between two to 4,000 eggs, and you can see how that can increase our number of ticks that we have in a population very rapidly. What do play a role in the Lyme disease and the culprit of the spread of Lyme disease is the white-footed mouse and small mammals. So when uh, mice have, are infected, ticks can be feeding on the mice and you can have multiple ticks feeding at a time and they can all become infected because the mouse is infected. Or you can have an infected tick feeding on the mouse, infecting all ticks at the same time. So there's a lot of different um, factors that play into it, but they pick it up, the Lyme disease and most pathogens from the um, white-footed mice and small mammals. So why are we seeing an increase and why do you think back to when you were younger or playing in the backyard when you were a kid and you didn't really have to worry about ticks? There's a lot of factors that play a role in the, our increase in tick populations. The one I mentioned already was our uh, wildlife populations play a key role in increasing the number of ticks that we see. So if you think back to how many deer were in um, our areas in, across Pennsylvania in the 70s when we had a lot of um, farmlands and then we had restoration and restoring our forest cover and now we have an increase in influx of our white-tailed deer population. Um, so the more wildlife we have, the more ticks we'll see. Um, we also have temperature shifts allowing more ticks to survive through the winter months and actually lay their eggs and laying their eggs, again, they can lay two to 4,000 eggs. We also have more residential areas creating pockets. I'll talk about that on the next slide more. We have more black-legged ticks, which um, are carrying and transmitting the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, which moves us to more spirochetes, that's the bacteria. And the spirochetes are uh, evolving very rapidly. Bacteria has been around much longer than we have, um, and they're able to evolve and mutate much quicker than uh, a human can evolve. Um, and then we just have more mice, our mice population is surviving longer because we're decreasing the biodiversity, and I'll get into this on this slide here. So when we create pockets and forest fragmentation, we're uh, pushing out our predators, such as foxes and coyotes that feed on mice, allowing the mice population to flourish, and they increase in numbers. And you can see these two pictures at the top right, fragmented populations, you have um, a ton of mice, and then if you have a forested area, you have a smaller amount of mice because you have more predators feeding on them. So just to get into a little bit about tick-borne diseases, the one you guys heard of the most is going to be Lyme disease caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, it was first identified in Lyme, Connecticut, and it has dated back from some studies um, prior to that. It is found throughout the Northeast and Midwest, and it's been increasing in its numbers. It's transmitted by that black-legged deer tick, um, and it's primarily transmitted in the wildlife by the white-footed mice. Um, there are also co-infections, so I did put up the slide that went over all the different pathogens that are found across Pennsylvania, but each tick is going to be associated with the transmission of different pathogens, and each one of these tables is a tick with its pathogens associated with it. So the first one is your black-legged tick, second is your American dog tick, and the third is your lone star tick. And each one of these can carry and transmit more than one pathogen at a time, which is called a co-infection, and this can complicate um, your diagnosis and treatment um, after exposure to a tick bite. So for instance, Lyme disease is a bacterial infection. Bacteria is treated with antibiotics. You have a viral infection, which is Powassan virus, and a protozoal infection as babesiosis. If a tick's carrying both Lyme and babesiosis, you have to be treated with two different types of um, regimens of treatment. You can't just be treated with one or the other because it will only treat either Lyme or babesiosis. So it can be very challenging um, in diagnosis when you're exposed to more than one pathogen. Um, disease transmission is, is very important because the length of time that the tick is attached and feeding will determine your risk of exposure. So as soon as you come in from outdoors in areas that you have found or, or know that are habitats of tick, you want to do a uh, check to get these ticks off as soon as possible. Um, we have pathogens that can transmit as fast as 15 minutes, like the Powassan virus, and Lyme disease, which can transmit in about 18 to 24 hours. Um, Rickettsia rickettsii is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and that's about six hours. So time is of essence, so the faster you can find the tick and remove the tick, um, the less chance you have of exposure to a pathogen. Um, and the nymphal ticks are the most important to worry about because of their size. It does become very challenging to find them very quickly because they're so tiny and then when they start to burrow in, it's really, really um, hard to find them. 
So you want to do a good job at removing them before they're on for too long. Um, and you want to check for ticks as soon as possible, as soon as you come in from these outdoor areas. A recent study um, in 2015 looked at every county across Pennsylvania and had identified the black-legged tick in every county of Pennsylvania. And it also looked at our three most common pathogens. That's the Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis. And I did mention how Lyme disease and babesiosis together can be challenging for transmission. And you can see here that we find rates of Lyme disease anywhere between um, 37 and 61 percent, depending on regions. Um, so you can find your region on here and see what your exposure rate is. And then anaplasmosis is around uh, 2 to 5 percent, and the babesiosis, again, is around 2 to 5 percent uh, as well. Um, so we do have these pathogens, and they are found across Pennsylvania, and we're seeing more pathogens being introduced to the state. Um, so you can continuously monitor uh, the population and what you could be exposed to. So at that time, I oh wait no I'm no I'm pausing. Preventing tick bites yeah. is Michelle. Yeah, thanks Nicole. Um, hi everybody, it's Michelle. I'm going to go ahead and get started with preventing tick bites. Now that we have a good background on what ticks are and where they live, where we may come in contact with them, it's really important to understand how we can prevent tick bites. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is our DARE acronym, and that's the acronym we use um, to help you remember the key things that you want to do, the steps you want to take in preventing tick bites. So the first being to defend yourself and your property. So how do we do that? Well, defending yourself, the first thing is dressing for protection. So you've seen in the previous slides the coloration of these ticks tend to be dark. Of course, we were talking about the black-legged deer tick, so we recommend wearing lighter color clothing because it will be easier to see the ticks, being that they're a little darker in color. We also suggest that you consider wearing long pants, a shirt, and a, a hat or, or a headband, some type of head covering. And it may seem kind of crazy as the weather's getting warmer to put more clothing on, but truly you want to have the least amount of uncovered skin as possible because of course that's what the ticks are looking for. So we even suggest considering wearing a tighter weave sock that you could pull up and kind of tuck your pants in. And some people even like to wrap tape around to kind of seal that connection of your socks and your pants because if the tick happens to latch on to that lower portion of your leg, they're, they're obviously going to have a much harder time getting in and, and finding some exposed skin. So once you've got the clothing down, we also suggest that you spray any remaining bare skin and you can consider utilizing DEET. 20% or more strength for adults and 10% for kids. Obviously, the higher the concentration, the longer the amount of time of protection. And I do encourage everybody to be sure that you're reading the bottle of the repellents that you're using and understand the length of time that you have protection. So if you put some repellent on in the morning and then you're outdoors for maybe eight or 10 hours, if that protection has worn off in four to six hours, it would be important for you to reapply if you're still outdoors. So you can also, beyond DEET, consider products using IR3535 or Picardin. And if you're looking for a less toxic option, there are products like BioUD and Lemon Eucalyptus that are also effective in repelling ticks. Once you've got your skin protected, you can really give some strong consideration to spraying your clothes, shoes, and socks with permethrin. And we recommend kind of getting into a routine. So there's actually permethrin pre-treated clothing that can help reduce tick bites. There are several companies, um, Buzz Off and Insect Shield are some examples. We've also listed some other brands on this slide, and again, you'll get a copy of this. But there are places that sell pre-treated clothing, or you can, through Insect Shield, send your own clothing in, whether it's a school uniform, maybe it's the, the clothing that you always wear when you're gardening or going camping, your child's sports uniform you may want to consider sending in. Insect Shield will treat them with the permethrin and send them back to you, and pre-treated clothing is good for up to 70 washings. Also want to point out that it really doesn't take long to spray to protect yourself um, and to get the, once you have the clothes treated with permethrin, you know, wearing those clothes consistently, just by spraying your shoes alone with permethrin can offer 74 times the protection from a tick latching onto your shoes and crawling up your leg. So that's a pretty significant level of protection. So spray options we touched on, there are chemical options, which the CDC recommends repellents that contain 20% or more of DEET, Picardin, or IR3535. 
um, on any exposed skin, and that will last for several hours. Again, I encourage you to just be sure that you're reading the bottle and you understand the length of time that you have that protection and when you may need to reapply. There are also the natural options. These natural options aren't subject to EPA testing because they're deemed safe for humans. Um, but that also can mean that they're not required to submit as many reports and tests about their effectiveness. But I can tell you that studies have been done on a lot of the natural essential oils for tick repellents, and they have been found to be effective. So we've listed out some resources if you want to take a look at what the, the evidence is behind some of your chosen repellents. And again, this is available to you. So after you're defending yourself, we also really want to talk about some home prevention. Um, you, you really want to create an environment that's just completely inhospitable for ticks. Nicole had mentioned earlier that ticks need moisture to live, and so though we may have a tendency to place our child's play area and our picnic tables and the areas in our yard that we like to hang out, we, we might have a tendency to want to put them under a nice big shady tree, um, but truly in order to reduce the exposure to ticks, you really want to increase your sunlight. You want to get those items out into the sun. You want to consider even using maybe some bark chips um, as opposed to some of the, the mass planting around the edges, which again is going to increase moisture and allow the ticks to have an area where they can, where they can live and potentially come in contact with you. So you want to try to create a tick safe zone. The highest risk areas are those lawn areas that are adjacent to the woods. Most ticks are actually found within nine feet from the wood's edge, so it's really important to keep your lawn mode really short because, again, they'll have more sun exposure and they're not going to really survive out there. Um, you can also consider creating a three-foot wood chip barrier, and we recommend the Atlantic Yellow Cedar because cedar has some repellent qualities as well, and the ticks don't like to cross that barrier. You can also consider more of like a hardscape barrier like stone or gravel. Um, and then we also suggest that you consider some scheduling some tick killing spray treatments, especially in those risky areas where you do spend a lot of time. And we recommend that you do that, again, maybe not just once a year, but two, maybe even three times a year. You want to know the product that you're using and how long that protection will last. And the other thing you can consider is maybe some exclusion fencing. Again, as Nicole mentioned, if you're living in an area where there are deer, then you're going to have ticks. So you might want to consider exclusion fencing to kind of reduce the access the deer have to your yard. Again, the, the time targeted spraying, there are both chemical and non-chemical options. The chemical options tend to be with permethrin, and there are companies I know that, um, that sell these products, home and garden centers carry these products. There are also, I know, uh, companies that offer lawn care service that offer chemical tick control agent spraying. There are also the natural organic sprays that you can use on your yard. Again, you want to consider these treatments, whichever option you choose, a few times a year. Um, Mid-May, mid-June, and mid-October are great times to consider, especially based on what we now know from Nicole's presentation in terms of when the ticks are active and looking for that blood meal. Another option you can consider to protect your property is in an attempt to reduce um, the mice. You can use things called tick tubes, and there's a company called Daminex that makes tick tubes pre-ready pre to go. But you can also make these on your own at home. You can use things like toilet paper roll, paper towel roll, maybe a piece of PVC pipe. Essentially what you're doing is you're getting cotton and you're, you're taking permethrin. You're pre-treating the cotton with the permethrin. And I just want to make sure everybody understands that permethrin does not go on your skin. It is just for clothing. When you're using it, you want to make sure you're reading the bottle and taking the precautions, wearing gloves, not getting it on your skin. Once you pre-treat the cotton and it dries, you can stuff that into the paper towel roll, the toilet paper roll, the PVC piping, and place it around your property in areas where you think you have an issue with mice. And again, you might want to consider the time of year that you're doing that when the mice are most active. What essentially what happens with the tick tubes is the mice go in, they take that cotton out for bedding, um, and the permethrin kills the ticks that are on the mice. So let's talk a little bit also about pet protection. We get a lot of questions about that. So we encourage you to talk to your vet. Um, there are lots of options out there for pet protection. There are topical products. There are collars. There's a vaccine for dogs. Um, so talk to your vet about the best option for your particular pet but we do encourage you to do tick checks either way. You want to look at areas like the ears, the eyes, 
the legs, the belly, and, and even the roof of their mouth is a good area to check for ticks. Um, you can also consider permethrin pre-treated blankets for dogs. Maybe if you have a, a car or truck that you always take and the dog goes along for uh, camping trips or out in the woods, um, if you pre-treat the dog's blanket with permethrin when they hop back in the truck or the car after they spent the day outside, with the permethrin on the blanket, it, it will kill the ticks that, are, that the dog may have picked up being outside that day. Um, cats is kind of interesting, but there's really no scientific evidence of cats getting Lyme disease. Um, but you should know that dogs and cats can bring ticks into your home where they can drop off and then infect you. So we do discourage you from allowing your pets on your bed and some of the furniture nuzzling up to you if they spend a lot of time outdoors and potentially have, could have picked up ticks. And I just want to make a note that permethrin can be fatal to cats if it's not dried. So again, you want to make sure you're drying the permethrin, you're applying it properly, reading the label, doing it outdoors. The next thing to consider in the DARE prevention program is avoiding those tick habitats. So Nicole had pointed out to us where you're mo more likely to find ticks in the high grasses, leaf litters, um, low ground covering. So it's not to say that you can't go outside. We live in a beautiful area. There are a lot of great things to do to recreate. Um, just be aware of the environment that you're in. Make sure you're practicing prevention. And you may want to con consider avoiding certain activities like crawling or kneeling in the, in the tall, wet grasses, um, stay on the path if you're out hiking, rather than wandering out into the forest edges where you know you're going to be more likely to come in contact with ticks. The next thing to consider is what to do when you come inside. So one of the first things we suggest is to remove your clothing and throw it in the dryer for 10 minutes. Don't even wash it first. Just get it in the dryer on high heat for 10 minutes. As Nicole mentioned earlier, ticks really need moisture to survive, so they're not going to survive in your dryer on high heat, even if it's just for 10 minutes. So that's step one that we suggest when you first come in. The next thing that we suggest is that you always remember to do a tick check and take a shower. So we suggest that within, within at least two hours after being outside or in an exposed area, get into the shower. Because if there's any ticks that are walking around on you to try to find a spot, they'll fall off in the shower if they're not attached. And ticks don't always immediately latch onto your ankle and dive right in. You know, they'll, they'll take their time. They'll walk usually up the body and find a spot that they want to latch onto. So once you've taken the shower, it's still important to check for ticks as soon as you can. And this slide shows you some highlighted areas on the body where ticks are most likely found. And as you can see, it's not to say that you, you could never get a tick bite on your ankle, but these highlighted areas are much further up the body. So it's really important to get in the shower. The loose ticks will fall off. And then check these areas. And we really encourage you to check your children as well. And if you need help having somebody check you know, your back or look along the, your hairline, we certainly encourage you to do that as well. The next thing is understanding how to eliminate ticks correctly. So after you've practiced all the prevention, if you should find a tick, how do I get it off properly? And that's really important to understand. What you want to do is grasp the tick firmly nearest to the head and as close to the skin as possible. Don't squeeze the belly of the tick. Just pull it straight out. Then you want to clean that area with an alcohol wipe or hot soapy water. And then, of course, you're going to start monitoring yourself for signs of infection. It's really important to understand that you should not twist the tick. Don't attempt to burn the tick off. Don't pour alcohol or peppermint oil or any kind of substance, petroleum jelly on the tick, and never squeeze the body of the tick. What happens when you do that, if the tick gets agitated or angry, it will regurgitate into you. And so if you didn't have a high exposure, exposure risk initially, that risk just went up significantly if the tick regurgitates into you because all of the bacteria that may be in the gut of the tick that hasn't worked its way up yet has now just been spewed out into your bloodstream. So it's really important not to do that. The other thing we, we um, wanted to include in the slide are some pictures of some studied tick removal tools. And they're not in any particular order. Um, but as you can see, there are some great options. There are tick, actual tick removers. You can also use blunt angled tweezers. And there are some really great tick cards that are available now at TickCheck.com. And I don't know if you can see it clearly in the slide, but they have two different notched edges. One is a slightly larger notch, which helps with the slightly larger ticks. And then the one in the, the small right corner is very small, which can help remove those nymphal ticks when they're very, very tiny and difficult to grasp. 
So what to do with the tick? Well, don't flush the tick down the toilet. Don't burn the tick. In fact, we suggest that you not discard the tick at all, but that you put it in a baggie with a moist cotton ball and you actually can save the tick in the freezer because that tick can be tested, particularly as you're monitoring yourself for signs of illness if you start to feel sick you may want to consider getting that tick tested so you know what you may have been exposed to, and it can really help your healthcare provider in treating you. Um, there are some great places you can send the tick for testing. TickCheck.com is affiliated with East Stroudsburg University. And what's really cool with TickCheck.com is that they do what is called Scoodle Index Reporting. So they can actually analyze how long the tick has been attached to you based on its engorgement size. And that's really helpful because that can help determine your risk for disease and what particular disease perhaps you may have even been exposed to. As Nicole referenced earlier, the longer the duration, the greater the risk of exposure for other types of diseases. There's also IgenX and tick report. Um, and if you happen to find some ticks that are not latched on, but you want to send them somewhere for some testing or for some research, there are some great labs doing research. Um, it's not for diagnosis. So again, if you found a tick that was crawling around or you think you have a lot of ticks on your property and you happen to be so inclined to collect them for some reason, you can send them to the Bay Area Lyme Foundation or Drexel University School of Medicine, and they're doing um, some great tick research as well. So what to do if you have been bitten? So now we've already discussed how important it is to get the tick off you as quickly as possible. It's also equally important to get diagnosed and treated as early as possible. So some of the early signs and symptoms of Lyme disease are very similar to that of the flu. You can experience things like fever, chills, fatigue, general weakness. You might have some headache. Um, the picture there on the upper right is that classic bullseye rash. And I just want to point out that 50% of the time, people don't even get the rash or don't recognize or remember seeing a rash. But if, in fact, you do get a bullseye rash, that is a positive Lyme disease sign. You, you really don't even need to get the blood work at that point. That is considered a positive um, sign for Lyme disease, and you should get to your doctor and get, and get going on your treatment. Now, Lyme disease has a wax and wane cycle to it. So you may initially feel flu-like, and then you get better. And then it comes back again, and you feel sick again, and maybe you're starting to experience more headaches. So if you observe a waxing and waning of your symptoms after a potential exposure, you really want to consider speaking with your health care provider about the possibility of a Lyme exposure. Um, again, the early symptoms are flu-like, and you may or may not get the rash. Then there's an early disseminated level of Lyme disease where it starts to progress into other organs or parts of your body. This is when you might start to experience more joint pain and some sleep disturbances. It's very, very common to see a swollen knee, either one or both, with disseminated Lyme. You start to experience more headaches. The fatigue starts to increase more. And you can even develop Bell's palsy, which is the picture in the lower right. And that's a, um, a facial drooping on one side. It's a paralysis on one side of the face. So that's another really big sign. If someone develops Bell's palsy and there's really no other cause as to why it would happen, you want to, again, get to your healthcare provider and discuss the possibility of a Lyme exposure. Then there's late disseminated or persistent Lyme disease. And this is what happens when Lyme is not caught early and diagnosed and treated. It can disseminate and become persistent and lead to things like arthritis and a fatigue, which really can become quite debilitating for people. It can also lead to cognitive problems and even significant cardiac complications. So these are some pictures of the bullseye rash. Um, and again, less than 50% of the people recall a bullseye rash. But if you get a bullseye rash, it is a positive diagnostic for Lyme. So the upper left picture, you can see a pretty classic bullseye. But the other two pictures are not as classic, and they may not be what you expect. It can be several concentric circles. It can be razor flat. It may be warm. It may be painless or painful. Um, they can really vary consistent, considerably in size and appearance. So we wanted to show you a few. Here's a few more. Um, they can be irregular in shape. The, the one in the bottom right corner is a small child. And as you can see, that's not as typical of a classic bullseye, but it's definitely a, a bullseye rash. You can have several circles. Um, they're not always in the spot that you got bit. 
um, it doesn't necessarily mean you got bit by five ticks at the same time, and that's why you have five red circles. So it's just important to understand that there's variation to these rashes. 53% of the people that have persistent symptoms also have co-infections, which are reported and confirmed to, through laboratory testing. And Nicole had mentioned earlier there are many, many co-infections, and you can get a co-infection as well as Lyme disease from a single tick bite. So one single bite of a tick can give you Lyme plus co-infections. Um, and 30% of the people with Lyme disease reported two or more co-infections. So it's really important to understand that being infected with Lyme disease, getting co-infections is really more the norm than it is the exception. It really happens uh, quite, quite a lot, actually more than half the time. And when you get infected with co-infections, the, often the care, these people get sicker and they stay sicker longer and they may not respond to that initial course of treatment for Lyme disease alone because as Nicole mentioned, you may have been infected with a protozoal or a, or a viral infection and that may need a different course of medication. So again, and I won't read through all these, but there are uh, hallmark symptoms of co-infections. Some of them mimic Lyme disease, fever, headaches, fatigue, uh, some of them have very significant, um, some have rashes, which I have a, the next slide, this is a Bartonella rash. And as you can see, they're um, like purple, uh, purple lesions. They really look very similar to stretch marks. So this is a type of rash. And again, Bartonella, you want to consider what the signs and symptoms are. And um, your healthcare practitioner may opt to modify your treatment plan if you're not getting better and you have some signs. So this is just another example of, of a co-infection rash and what it may look like. So why is all this important? Because when Lyme disease is considered, co-infections really need to be considered as well because different infections may require different tests to be diagnosed and different infections might require different treatments. And if you're only treating Lyme disease and you're not getting better, then you may result in persistent symptoms due to one of the other co-infections. So when do you see your doctor? Well, if you have any new onset symptoms after a tick bite or even after a possible exposure, you really want to spend some time talking with your doctor. Um, remember the 50% rule. 50% of the population does not recall a tick bite and 50% of the time they don't recall a rash. So it's really important to track your symptoms. Lyme disease very often becomes a clinical diagnosis. I encourage people to jot down their symptoms and you can start to see a pattern. Again, remember that your symptoms may wax and wane, so you might feel sick and then better and then sick again. So that's important to track that and discuss that out with your doctor. So in summary, what you really wanna know is that you can prevent Lyme and tick-borne diseases. You just need to know what works and you need to practice the prevention. The vast majority of tick bites occur in our own backyard or in our own area, places that we spend time all the time. So you wanna consider protecting yourself and your children and your property. Tick-borne diseases can have very serious health consequences, including even cognitive and psychiatric issues. So again, catching this disease early is very important and you wanna monitor yourself and your children who we now know are very high risk for any signs and symptoms after a potential exposure. And I encourage everybody to consider um, staying up to date on some of the science because again, it's emerging very rapidly and palime.org has a great website and you can find many, many resources there. Um, we have a list of all the resources referenced in what we talked about today. And again, this presentation is available for you. I also wanna point out that PA Lyme Resource Network has several 18 plus, we're growing, <laughs> we're growing all the time, regional support groups across the state. We have them east and west side of the state now, and they are great resources for prevention education and patient advocacy. So you can go on our website and locate a support group nearest to you. And I also want to mention Tick Encounter Resource Center, which is also another great resource, and they are a PA Lyme prevention partner in our efforts to spread prevention awareness. And I just want to kind of wrap up with understanding your role in the community for prevention. So if you feel that you've learned something beneficial today, we really encourage you to get the word out about this program. 
the Dare to be Tick Aware program encouraged the schools to provide this type of program to educate the students and the faculty. Talk to your kids' sport coaches about this program. Talk to your township leaders, your county leaders, the council members, commissioners. Um, educate your friends and your neighbors on what you've learned today and keep up to date with all the information through PA Lyme Resource Network Facebook. And um, you can also consider talking to your legislators about some preventative actions that can be taken. And again, our PA Lyme Resource Network is a great website to figure out um, some direction on how you can do that. So at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Nikki, and she's going to um, facilitate some of the questions. Thank you. Michelle and Nicole, thank you so much. That was fantastic information. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat box. I am going to start with this question. It says, I contacted RMSF several years ago and was told at the time that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I contracted RMSF several years ago and was told at the time that RMSF could be transmitted without a bite, um, but also contracted through blood or feces from a tick. Is that accurate? So um, this is Nicole speaking. The ticks do not have feces. Um, they are not capable of doing that. Uh, it can be contracted through um, the tick's blood if the blood is, if they're taking in your blood, the pathogens within its salivary glands, and that's how it's transmitted into you. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is only transmitted by the bite of a tick. But um, if you go back to what Michelle said a little bit ago, not everyone remembers having a tick bite or exposure to those pathogens. So it's very possible it was from a tick. Um, if that, I hope that answers your question. If not, please let us know in the chat box um, if you want further clarification while we're going through the other questions. Um, as we're going through the other questions, please remember um, you can still ask us additional questions in that chat box. Our next question is, is there any type of pre-treatment like a shot or medication, I'm assuming this means like a vaccine, um, for Lyme or other tick-borne disease? Uh, this is Nicole again. There is not a vaccine. There was in the late 90s and early 2000s, but it was removed from the market because it was causing people to essentially have Lyme-like symptoms. Um, to oh. date, there is no knowledge of a vaccine going to be brought to the market anytime soon. Um, the Lyme bacteria, if you think of it like the flu vaccine, um, it's very rapid in its mutations and there are over 100 strains. And it becomes very challenging to guess because you only can put three strains within a vaccine, um, which three strains are going to be the ones that are going to transmit to you. Um, so it's very hard to have an accurate vaccine that would uh, be put on the market. Um, furthermore, the only like quote-unquote pretreatment you can have is there are some studies looking at prophylactic treatment, meaning you can get, if you're bitten by a tick, you can have a couple doses of antibiotics um, prior to symptoms, and it may or may not help you with your uh, um, long-term effects if exposed. Great. Okay, another question we have, are there any resources we can share with our healthcare providers who may not always consider tick-borne illness? Um, and this is asking from a patient and employer perspective. Absolutely. So PA Lyme Resource Network, if you just go to palyme.org, all of the resources and everything that we discussed today is available on the website. Um, they can also contact, um, Amy might chime in on this one, but if they contact Amy, she could probably get them some plant pamphlets and information about this program that they can um, have at the facility. And also, if you know any physicians that would be interested in a um, prevention awareness program like this, you can let them know it's out there and they can sign up. Um, the PA Lyme Resource Network also does continuing med medical education courses for physicians yearly, so they can also attend those for more information. Fantastic. And I can say from the Get Outdoors PA perspective, we actually get a lot of um, nurses who've called and asked for the uh, Lyme disease brochure, which has been updated recently with the PA Lyme Network as well. Um, do we have any other questions at this time that anyone would like to, to ask through the chat box? If we do not, you can always feel free to um, send questions to me, Nikki Tesher, at um, my email address, and we will share that. 
um, in the chat box. It's also available on the PRPF and Get Outdoors PA website. Um, but we again want to thank Nicole and Michelle for speaking with us today. It was fantastic information. Um, don't forget that individuals desiring continuing education credits for this webinar must complete the quiz. Um, the link is located on the current slide. Um, once you complete the quiz, a letter of completion will be emailed to you from the Pennsylvania Recreation and Park Society. If you are interested in becoming a Get Outdoors PA community partner, you can contact me or click on the link on the slide that you see right now. Um, the information will also be available when you receive the presentation and slides in an email, um, which you should receive early uh, next week. And again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nicole and Michelle, and we hope you have a fantastic day.